Well, Mitchell Asset News, my name is Rob, and today, just like the thumbnail and title suggests, we just saw that uh, the PPI numbers came in, inflation is actually down, so why are the markets tumbling? So we're going to take a look at that right now, so let's just jump right in. So first things first, this just came out about an hour ago or so, PPI numbers, the pr producer price index came in, and it was 0.5% lower than expected, and this uh, compared to the Dow Jones estimate for a 0.1% decrease, and it uh, decreased by half a point. So congratulations, the Fed's doing its job, inflation is going down, everybody should be happy. Now again, the, the PPI, which is the producer price index, what the producers have to pay for their specific goods and services and things like that, that is the precursor to the consumer price index of what they have to pay, or, or actually us. So a sharp drop in energy prices helped bring the headline inflation ring down for the month. PPI's final demand plunged 7.9%. Retail sales fell 1.1%, which is slightly more than the 1% forecast. So that's pretty good. And actually, if we take a look at a friend of the show, Trueflation, there's a link in the description for the website. It's 100% free. You can check this out. What I like about Trueflation is it's real-time data. It pulls in real-world data using an oracle called Chainlink, which is a cryptocurrency or a digital asset. And it pulls this, this great amount of information, food and non-alcoholic beverages, housing, transportation, utilities, health, and so on and so forth. And when the Fed was telling us that, you know, inflation was only 9% or whatever they said it was, and it was transitory, we could see with true inflation that was uh, not accurate. And we can just see now because it's such, it's such real-time data that, yeah, inflation is going down quite precipitously and looking pretty good here in the States. Now, unfortunately for our friends across the pond in the UK, uh, it's uh, not looking too good, especially with, of course, utilities, but hopefully things uh, rectify themselves. So, the, the PPI is looking good. This is on top of, we just saw a week ago, the CPI, uh, January 12th came out and said, hey, look, uh, went down to 6.5%. That's down from 7.1% in November. Uh, consumers saw deflation during the monthly, largely due to plummeting gas prices. And this is from Mark Zandi, chief economist at Moody's. He goes, I don't think people will be talking about inflation this time next year, which is pretty optimistic, but that's what I want to hear. So inflation is going down. Looks like the Fed's doing its job. So the market should be happy, right? Well, no. Uh, S&P 500 is down 1.05%. NASDAQ is down 0.84%. And of course, the crypto markets are also down because I think there's a little bit more correlation than what people tend to believe. I think there's a lot more uh, institutional investors and people from Wall Street gambling over here, but that's just my personal opinion. So that's what we got. So why is this happening? Well, it kind of goes like this. People who are into stocks and Wall Streets and institutions or whoever you are, you're investing into the market, whether that traditional market, and you're probably dabbling into the crypto. In traditional markets, there's this thing called earnings, and earnings reports come out, and what they want to see is how strong different companies are. And as we can see, things like this will spook the market, as Microsoft, which just came out today, is laying off 10,000 employees. Microsoft, pretty big company. And if they're not doing well, nobody's doing well. Also, Facebook, uh, they just did, had some massive layoffs themselves. Twitter had massive layoffs. And uh, other companies uh, throughout the uh, world, mostly in, also in the United States, are laying off a ton of employees. And that is not good because that gives everybody the jitters, especially on Wall Street. And, of course, other places. Now, you have to understand, when we see these types of layoffs, then that doesn't bode well for the stock market. Yes, the Fed did its job. Yes, inflation is going down. Unfortunately, it's affecting everything, and that'll be a bumpy ride for quite some time. On top of this, you also have to take a look at some other macro factors. Housing. So this was a report uh, from uh, Venture Consulting, and it states KB Homes, a large home builder, reported a 68% cancellation rate. What does that mean? That means when you go out there and you, you're looking for a house, you go, I want to put a, a contract on this. This house is mine. Let me put some down payment on that. You go, all, you go through the whole process, and then when, it, when it's time to actually pony up, you're like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. There was a 68% cancellation rate. That is pretty high. How high is that? Well, it says right here. This cancellation rate of 68% is larger than the 2008 crash. Back then, builders like DR Horton peaked at a 50% cancellation rate, and we already blew past that in late 2022. So, Looking at housing, kind of take a look at what's going on with the macro environment, not so great. And on top of that, don't forget about the debt. So the U.S. debt ceiling nears, and a uh, friend of the show, Janet Yellen, who I believe watches, warned the federal government would reach its statutory debt limits of 
31.4 trillion on January 19th. Today is the 18th. 31.4 trillion. And states, we're talking about the government's, we're, ta we're talking about the USA, which is the world's largest economy with the deepest financial markets and controls the, the global reserve currency. And we have almost $32 trillion in debt. Yellen said she's going to implement extraordinary measures to reach an agreement before a shutdown of the government is necessary. This includes a limit to the new debt that can be issued, meaning let's just raise the ceiling, which will reduce the supply of U.S. treasuries, push up the prices and lower the bond yields. That's actually good because lower yields imply an easier monetary environment, which is good for risk assets such as crypto, Bitcoin and digital assets. And just to make that a visualization, here's a U.S. debt clock. I'll also link that in the description. You can check it out. But uh, that 31.4, we already hit it, baby. So today is the 18th. We're just a little bit early. So USA, here we go. And that's, of course, taking a look at the different national debt through China, Japan, Germany, UK, and India. And of course, the public debt to GDP ratio. Look at that, 94% USA. Not as bad as Japan, 296%. So that's what we have as far as the macro event. What does this mean? Well, look, I know it's a little bit scary to think about. But in the last part that like we talked about, there's actually a little wiggle room for some risk on assets such as digital assets. And let's get into that. So yesterday, actually the last two days or so, we've been talking about Avalanche. And before we go on, let me just make something 100% uh, crystal clear. People ask me, Rob, why are you talking about Avalanche so much? You never talk about it. Well, there's two reasons. First of all, I own it and I'm super biased. I usually only talk about the things that I own or I'm going to get ready to buy. That is for sure. So if if your coin, I don't know what it is, tomato coin or something, uh, went into a deal with Elon Musk and Tesla, I'd probably be talking about tomato coin all day long. So so there is no illusions. I own Avalanche and I am super biased. All right. So this article that we talked about a couple of days ago, well, First, we talked about the Amazon partnership, which is pretty cool. Then we also talked about uh, the Shopify partnership with the NFTs. I'll link those videos in the description. You can check those out. And then there was a, a comment from Avant-Garde Hanja. Nailed it. And he said, Rob, don't forget over the last two months that uh, Avalanche also had a partnership with Alibaba, the third largest cloud provider. Alibaba is kind of like the Amazon of the Asian world, and especially in China. He says, uh, KRKK, financial giant, 480 billion assets on his balance sheet. I couldn't find them, so sure. Then he talked about Amazon Plus, which we talked about. And then another one called Tog EV Car Manufacturer. I think they're out of Turkey. And uh, they, they're really not a big player that I can see so far right now. But this one was interesting. I didn't know about, first of all, I didn't know about the Alibaba one, but the GRI, which is the Japanese uh, gaming uh, business. And of course, this is the Avalanche and Alibaba partnership. You can check that out. But GRI, which I never heard of before because I'm in America, don't really get uh, much exposure to that. GRI is not a small time player. Net sales of 74 or 75 billion, operating income of almost 12 billion, 12 billion. Uh, net sales of 20 billion, 3.8 billion. This is in yen, not in dollars. And then, of course, if we take a look, so not a small time player, right? We're going to say that's uh, doing pretty good. And when I took a look at this, this happened two months ago. I don't think anybody talked about it because no one really cared about Avalanche, I guess. I didn't, that's for sure. But uh, things just kind of snowball. And I want to make something also crystal clear. Pay attention to those crypto projects that are building in the bear because they will crush it in the bull. So taking a look at this, what are they doing? So uh, BLRD, a subsidiary of the Japanese gaming house and internet media company, Gree. And Ava Labs, Ava Labs, Avalanche, formed a strategic partnership aimed at accelerating BLRD's growth in blockchain as it plans to launch its first Web3 game in 2023. Uh, BLRD's uh, multi-decade history of gaming leadership include releasing the first ever mobile social game, Fishing Star. And their highlights of they have 30 million active monthly users across its game. Let me say that one more time. 30 million across its games. Web3 is going to be the next big thing. Blockchain gaming, it's a pretty good idea. They work with top gaming companies, Square Onyx, Sega, Konami, Bandai. And uh, they got millions of downloads. Popular IP and mobile gaming, such as One Punch Man. I don't know what that is, but okay. Ava Labs will help spur BLRD's growth into blockchain gaming, providing technical marketing business ecosystem support. So again, this is looking pretty promising for Avalanche. However, be aware that we took a look at the tokenomics yesterday. Not the best. 
just going to let you just going to put it out there. So don't go out there and be like, oh, I'm just going to dump a bunch of aval uh, buy a bunch of avalanche because this guy on YouTube talked about it. It's a big mistake. So look, I'm not your dad. I can tell you what you do. This is not financial advice. Watch all the videos because, like I said, some of those things for avalanche, not the greatest. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also, I just wanted to briefly touch on this. I think this is how it should be done. Coinbase asks Japan customers to withdraw holdings as it halts operations. So instead of them just kind of like rug pulling everybody and going, hey, you can't pull your, your funds out, FTX, Voyager, Celsius. Uh, they're like, hey, we're a legit company. You need to take your funds out. So this is what's going on. Coinbase asked customers in Japan to withdraw crypto and fiat holdings by February 16th ah, as it halts operation to conduct a complete review of its business in the country, meaning we're not granting much traction here. We're probably going to pull out. After February 16th, you can they, the holdings will go to Japanese yen and you can get it through a legal affairs bureau, blah, blah, blah. So I just thought it was interesting about how, you know, that's how it should be done. We're going to shut down, take your funds out. We don't want to screw you guys move forward. And lastly, lastly, as a reminder, we're coming up to the end of the month for the uh, Sweatcoin challenge. So again, Sweatcoin, download the app, it's free, tokens are free. And the people that have the most uh, steps are going to win some pretty cool prizes, right? Uh, Ledger, Token Metrics, Coin Ledger, and also Coin Ledger, uh, that thing that's sticking above my head, the tax season is coming up. You know, you can sign up for this thing for free and you can just do a cost analysis. Now, when you generate a port, it costs money. But this is what I use twice and two years in a row for all my crypto taxes. It tells me all the things that I did, API integration to all the different, even DeFi, your MetaMask wallet, all the centralized crap exchanges that are out there. It'll do that, give you your, this is how much your cost basis is. This is how much you're going to cost or you know, to pay in taxes. Ship every CPA is done. Anyhow, the winners are going to get a uh, coin ledger or the winner for first place. But we got winners for second place, third, fourth, fifth, all the way to number 30. And if you want to see how you're doing, first of all, if you want to sign up, use my link, uh, of course, for this part here, links in the description. But if you want to sign up, sign up and use your username, just click here, out of the competition. And if you want to see who's winning, let's just click here. And this is a little concerning at first. See these uh, number of steps? 795,000 for our hardcore analysis. I did the math. It was like 50,000 steps a day, right? That's a lot of steps. That's like 2,000 steps are roughly a mile. This person is walking 25 miles a day. And then the next one is Jersey Boy and down here. And you can take a look at all this. So I asked the quick question. I was like, hey, is this right? Because if you're walking 25 miles a day, that's a lot. And uh, yeah, apparently so. So someone said, yeah, I walk near, nearly 20 miles a day as a waiter. And I was like, no kidding. And then DBL Gog says, I'm a bartender. I walked almost 17 miles this past Saturday and it was a slow night. I'm like, man, I got to get a job as a bartender. And then I'm going to link this one as well. You can, you can look through it. But a lot of people were like, yeah, that, I've done that before. I've done these things. But some people were like, that'll never happen. So I reached out to Hardcore Analysis. I'm like, I'm like my man, how are you doing that? And he got back to me and said this. He said, look, uh, I work for Health Canada. So it probably doesn't work that hard. Just kidding. I, I'm just kidding, Canadians. I have a treadmill desk at home. I work from home. I walk about 30 to 60 minutes an hour at 3.5 3 to 4 miles per hour. If you walk for eight, eight hours a day, okay. That makes sense, actually. Uh, I usually hit around 30 to 40,000 steps before the end of the workday, and I've been walking extra to try to win the competition. Let me know if you need more details. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Because every time I go walk my dog, it's about 8,000, 10,000 steps. And that's just in like an hour. So we have a pretty good pace. And then I was just thinking to myself, man, maybe I should get one of these uh, desks that you, you know, I have a desk that raises up. Maybe I can lose some more weight, get in shape, all the good stuff. Anyhow, that's it for today. I have to drone on, but that's it for today. So look, if you like the uh, content, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is very time sensitive, but that's it for today's video. So thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.